with Ian Dale. Hello, good evening and welcome to Cross Question, LBC's weekly political panel debate show. We'll be here in LBC's Westminster studio each Wednesday at 8pm on the dot to answer questions from you, the LBC listeners and viewers. Now, as well as listening to us on the radio, you can watch us on Global Player and on LBC's YouTube, Facebook and Twitter feeds. If you'd like to take part in the show and ask our panel a question, all you have to do is pick up the phone and dial 0345 6060 and the line Lines are already open. We already have some calls. All previous episodes of the programme are on the Cross Question podcast and this show will appear there before midnight. Well, it's time to introduce our panel. In the studio with me in Westminster and socially distanced, of course, are the Labour MP for Vauxhall, Florence Eshalomi, and the founder of the Institute of Ideas, Baroness Claire Fox, who I shall henceforth address as Milady. And also joining us from Buckinghamshire, it's the former de facto Deputy Prime Minister, Sir David Liddington, and from North London, it's barrister and author of People Like Us, Hashi Muhammad, whose last appearance on my show was an absolute hit. Welcome to you all. Let's crack on and go to our first question, which comes from Alex in Watford. Alex, what would you like to ask? Good evening, Ian. Good evening, Adam. Hi. Is uh, Boris Johnson the biggest threat to the United Kingdom? Is Sir Keir Sturman correct? David Liddington. No. And whenever I've I talked to... The Prime Minister about devolution in the past. You know, he's always been someone who was in favour of it. Um, you know, he he models himself apart from European policy on Michael Heseltine, who was a great champion of devolution. Um, he, he Boris Johnson's a two-term mayor of London, a Conservative in a usually Labour conurbation. Um, I think the key thing is that to recognise the union is under great threat at the moment. And in my judgment, this is as much due to English indifference to the value of the union as to Scottish nationalism. And unionists need both to spell out the risks to Scotland or Northern Ireland of the sort of very uh, disruptive change that the nationalists in both places advocate, but also to to, to sing some positive songs about the union. Now, set out why the four home nations are better and stronger in the world working together, whether that is economically in negotiating uh, trade and uh, military cooperation agreements around the world, whether it's our, our network of embassies uh, in so many different countries, whether it's uh, an aid and development program that is known as one of the best and biggest bilateral aid programs in the world, armed forces, um, security services that are amongst the world leaders, those are assets that every part of the UK can draw upon at the but, moment. I think but when the Prime Minister case, says... A negative one we need. Well, Sorry? When the, Prime Minister, when the Prime Minister calls uh, devolution a disaster, that doesn't exactly help, though, does it? it it's well, with Scottish, res- Tor- respect, Scottish it, it, Tories... It, yeah. I mean, look, Ian, neither, okay. neither you or I were, were in that meeting, so I have no idea... Um, well, nobody's I've denied it. ...newspapers about what, what, what's been said or what the context was. What I'm saying is that when I've talked to Boris, Boris Johnson, I've heard him make speeches about this, he's been very clear about his support for devolution, and I think we have to have... Uh, a language and also a way of doing policy with this government now that recognises that there are two legitimate governments in Scotland, that there's a, a Scottish government at Holyrood currently, I hope not for long, run by the SNP, and there is a United Kingdom government. Each have their different areas of authority deriving from law, and they should, as they've done to to some extent over COVID, as they've done with other emergencies in the past work together um, because what we should all have in mind is what's going to be in the best interests of each part of the UK and I'd, I'd like to see more de- more devolution not less certainly to, to cities and counties okay. in England and for that matter in Scotland because the SNP has not touched devolution within Scotland. <clears throat> Hashim Mohammed, so is Boris Johnson the single biggest threat to the future of the UK? Devolution by definition is always going to be messy isn't it? Yes, um, to answer the question straight away, I think it's to put it too high to say that he is the single uh, biggest threat, but he certainly hasn't enhanced it and will not enhance it. Boris is a symbol of English sort of uh, uh, mindset that has taken, sadly, Scotland for granted for many years. His comments, if true, have obviously made sure that SNP is now 
much stronger position to try and fight for independence. He has been very careless with his language, very reckless with his approach. And I don't think that's going to be anything good for the United Kingdom as an entity, particularly given that this is somebody who was at the heart of the United Kingdom leaving the European Union and now could potentially either inadvertently or just clumsily and capriciously seeking to disassemble the United Kingdom as we know it. Devolution was a real power point, the point that apparently he was trying to make in relation to devolution and the introduction by Tony Blair's government to try and give more power to Scotland in an attempt to placate Scottish nationalism has not necessarily worked out. Mm. That's, I guess, a, a bigger point that is important to make and is certainly true that it hasn't placated it. But what we should be finding more ways of doing at the moment, especially now that we're about to sail off really on our own as an island, is more ways in which we can try and use our powers. And I very much agree with the former Prime Minister John Major when he was saying that we're an island nation that is not a superpower. And so the notion that we can then break up even further and still be relevant on the world stage is quite difficult to 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 fathom and quite difficult to imagine. But so I don't think he has, you know, demolished the, the union, but he hasn't enhanced it. Okay, uh, Florence, Boris Johnson, the single biggest threat. That that would be quite a claim, wouldn't it? I mean, Keir Starmer apparently did say that, but um, there are lots of other threats. Some people might say the Labour Party is a threat for your failure to uh, compete with the SNP in Scotland. No, no, and I think, um, just to go back to the point and the context in which Keir... Um, put that question I think the reality is if those comments from the Prime Minister were true it was quite disappointing and again I think you look back to devolution you know as as Hashi said as set out by the last Labour government you know really successful and what we need to do is actually look at how we bring more powers down to local levels the reality is by devolving powers and resources that's a key thing as well you'll get people, know they know their locality the best, so they will know how best to spend those resources. I think one of the things that I've seen since I've been an MP since December is this constant battle with the SNPs and, and, and the Prime Minister in terms of this constant threat of we want to leave. And I think it will be very, you know, very clumsy. We have to make sure, you know, fight everything to make sure that union stays intact but equally, we do need to look at some of the issues that the SNPs continue to raise around evolution and making sure that, you know, they respect that authority. And I think sometimes there's a case where the Tories aren't respecting that mandate. Well, one of the interesting things, I think, in the, the media response and indeed some of the political response to what Boris Johnson apparently said was that it's an absolute disgrace. He shouldn't be allowed to have that opinion. Why isn't it acceptable for politicians to give their honest opinion if they think devolution has been a disaster? Why shouldn't Boris Johnson be able to say that, particularly to his own MPs, who then, of course, leak it? I don't think it's not that he shouldn't be able to say that, but I think at, at a point where we are, where we are fighting a global pandemic... We need to work in collaboration with the SNP with, and, and it's a devolved government they have there. It's in their interest, our interest as a nation for everyone to work together. So having the arguments about whether or not the devolution in Scotland has, has worked, now is not the time. OK, Claire Fox, um, biggest single threat, Boris Johnson to the Union? No, I don't think he is. But picking up on your question, I actually think this is a debate we should be having because people have referred to Scotland a lot, but actually I'm from Wales and there is something of a disgruntlement about whether Wales is gaining from devolution because it was sold very much as more democracy whereas what's happened is the Welsh Assembly and the Senate are seen to be physically closer but politically miles away from a lot of the people of Wales it's not as though I mean you just basically you're got, from North Wales aren't I'm from North Wales I mean okay that's further from Cardiff than if you live in Cardiff but I can tell you that lots of people in South Wales have started there's a new party called Abolish which is to abolish the Senate you know it's doing reasonably well I mean you know not I'm, mm. but the, I'm just making the point it's not a settled question actually I think the greatest threat to devolution is that um, if you live in those areas if you live in Wales then the fact that the Welsh Assembly runs education and runs the NHS, and that's a kind of Labour Party with the Lib Dems, you know, a bit of Plaid thrown in. They're d not doing it very well. I mean, there's disastrous problems in Welsh education and in and, and in um, in the in health. 
Of course, now what's happening is the biggest threat in a way to devolution at the moment is COVID or the handling of it because Mark Drakeford, who runs the, you know, he's in charge of Wales, <laughs> for what's it, and minutes. Nicola Sturgeon, but yes, yeah, sorry, first minute. Um, the, the point is, is that they... They now kind of act as though, I mean, I, I agree with Florence, we should all be working together, but it's actually quite fragmentary, right? So, in fact, in North Wales, you know, they're basically just over the border in Chester got completely different rules. Mm. There's actually fragmentary within Wales because different areas were dealt with differently and there's been all sorts of tensions in relation to that. But he kind of acts, he does his daily press conference, giving him far more power in some ways. And people feel frustrated that they don't really feel that the UK is being taken seriously in Wales because it's actually a competition. And you can see that with Sturgeon. I mean, even the fact that you get this situation where the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, regardless of what one thinks of him, says something about devolution and is outrage as though he's breaking up the union, but from people who actually want to break up the union in so some ways. So that strikes me as being a contradiction in and of itself. David Lillington, actually, surely the biggest danger to devolution is the record of the three different administrations. If you look at Scotland, for example, they have plummeted down the International League tables on education and, I think, health outcomes. Now, if I was a voter in Scotland, I would look at that and think, well, why has that happened? Um, you, you can blame a political party, and yet... That they will, that political party in Scotland will still blame the Westminster government for all their woes. Yes, I think it's one of the challenges for the Scottish Conservatives in the forthcoming election for the Scottish Parliament will be to try to focus voters' uh, attention on declining school standards, lack of competitiveness in the Scottish economy. Um, worries about health and social care in, in, in Scotland every bit as much as in, in England or in Wales uh, and um, hold Nicola Sturgeon and her party to account for that. Um, and I do think that this talk by the SNP of the need for another referendum is in part a, a deliberate political distraction from that domestic record, which otherwise they would have to defend and might have difficulty in okay. doing so. I, I, I right. to tell you, let's be honest with it, the SNP has a single strategic objective that overrides everything else, which is to break away from the United Kingdom and have an independent mm. Scotland. And they have a bit of a best interest in cataloguing grievances. Imagine right, I want, to f I want to fit in one more question before we go to a break. So quick answers from all of you on this, if I can. I suspect you're all going to say the same thing. Uh, Will in Camberwell, what's your question, please? Coronavirus is on the rise today with more than 19,600 extra cases and 529 deaths with promising signs of a vaccine on the cards. Is it time for mandatory vaccination? Florence Oshalomi. <sighs> mandatory. I think what we need to do is make sure we address the issue of there are so many people at the moment who there's so much misinformation about a vaccine. I got sent an email on Sunday, actually, from a constituent close to the GP surgery that I've used all my life in the heart of my constituency in Brixton. And there was a big graffiti saying, don't trust government vaccine. And I think, you know, we need to look at that. If, the, if you look on TikTok, there's the hashtag vaccines do not work. It's been viewed over 817,000 times. There are Facebook groups with over 100,000 users mm. on these um, vaccine conspiracy theories. So I think we need to look at how we tackle some of that misinformation. I think the second thing we need to look at is how we make sure there's a national rollout of the vaccine. We cannot see that vaccine coming through and then the government hasn't hasn't got a plan on how we then get that vaccine to the people who need it. Who are going to be first for that vaccine? Who are going to be prioritised? Well, they have listed that. They have listed that and we need a clear plan in terms of how that will work. And I think thirdly, it's a case of who's then going to run those contracts. We've seen issues with government contracts. Um, I don't know if, uh, if any of your listeners might bring that up tonight. Well, you never know. But, you know, it's a case of making sure those contracts, there's transparency and public okay. money But essentially you wasted. don't believe in compulsory vaccine. I think what we need to do is make sure there's a clear public health message around yeah, but vaccination. That's not the question was, should they be mandatory? I've taken my flu jab this year. I'm petrified of needles. And I think for the vulnerable and people at risk, I think they should be. But okay. again, there needs to be public okay. health information around that. Claire Fox, as an arch libertarian, I imagine you don't think they should be mandatory. No, I don't think any vaccine should be mandatory. And that includes MMR. And I'm a great supporter of MMR. I mean, I, just to make that clear, yeah. I think it's the mandatory nature. One of the things, the civil liberties that was long fought for, actually, was the 
uh, right of an individual to refuse medical intervention, any medical intervention. So I think we shouldn't forget that. I know that we're all meant to accept the new normal, but there are certain things that I want to hold on to of the normal, which are, which are rights. I, I'm, what I'm actually worried about is this discussion about misinformation. I mean, I understand what Florence means, but I was really upset when I saw the Labour Party advocating, for example, or calling on the government to call on social media companies to ban misinformation on vaccination. Effectively, they actually use the words. But that will lead censor. to death, clear. No, I know. I understand the, the argument that's being used. I seriously think that this is going to create a backlash, a genuine backlash. So the big issue is trust. We need to persuade those of us who believe in the excitement around medical intervention on coronavirus, needed to persuade our fellow citizens of why they should take this vaccination, right? And we should be open and enthusiastic. But when you start saying ban, censor, calling people anti-vaxxers if they raise a question, there are anti-vaxxers, I understand that, but there's lots of people who just ask questions who get shut down as anti-vaxxers and demonised. It, it, I think it it's is, just going to backfire on us. Hashi Mohammed, it is quite reasonable for somebody to uh, say, well, look, th this vaccine hasn't been tested for as long as vaccines normally are. It's normally years that they test them, and people are quite entitled to ask for answers on that, aren't they? They are. I, and to answer your question reluctantly, I would say it would be a step too far to make it all mandatory. So I would be in principle against uh, making these mandatory. But the danger you have, though, is for a vaccine like this one, in order for it to work as the same as the MMR jab, for those vaccines and that kind of vaccination to work, you need a decent amount of the population to be vaccinated. You can make your own personal choice as to whether or not you want to be vaccinated if you are an adult of sound mind and no government should try and enforce it on you. But if you do not want to get vaccinated and yet wish to be part of society, you owe a duty of care to those people out there who are vulnerable, whose systems are compromised and who may not be able to get their own vaccinations. So there is a bigger question than a simple libertarian one of a personal choice and one in which we have to understand that when we are packed on a train or we are going to school or we are mixing with each other in the workplace, the person next to you relies on you as an individual mm. to play your role and be responsible. I feel we're in an episode of the Moral Maze at the moment, uh, Claire. Something you're well, I, very familiar. I don't know whether you want me to come back. I mean, just I, I, I believe in that social solidarity. But what I'm saying is, you can't force it. No. Social solidarity has to be voluntary. Otherwise, it's coercion. And I'm suggesting, and I, I, there was a great article by Ken and Malik in the Observer the other day on, on Sunday, which just made the point that what we have to do is to somehow create trust in medical science. And all I'm saying is, all this talk about, and if you don't take it you will be responsible for, you know, I mean, the kind of uh, granny I agree thing. on that. Do, yes, I just I don't, I just okay. don't, okay. it's not libertarian, that's the point I was going to make. David Livingston. It's about civil li quick, quick liberty, it's different. You. Yeah, I, I, I don't think uh, that it should be mandatory, which you know, taken taken to its logical conclusion would lead to people having criminal records if they refuse to have the, the vaccine. Uh, but I, I and there'll always be some people who have perhaps a medical condition or something else that means they genuinely should not have uh, a, a vaccine of a particular type. But I do think that we should not only have peer pressure and uh, a big public information campaign, I hope not just led by politicians, it needs to enlist other people mm. to whom yeah, the public will, will listen. But also, I think it's perfectly reasonable for, say, airlines and airports to say that you are not going through the airport or getting on a flight unless you can show you have been vaccinated or perhaps have a medical certificate to say that mm. you have a condition that means that's not possible. So I, I don't should we all have our passport stamped, do you think? Um, well, that would be one way of doing it. And that, that would actually be a, a, a way or perhaps someone has a, if, be able to download a... Uh, a, a sort of some sort of laissez passe with a with a, an individualised barcode. Um, but you know, that I can't. That won't happen immediately. But I think one could move towards that. I don't. I wouldn't have an objection. To we could all be branded that, on, that, on that. I, I'm, I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm nervous. I don't like it. But can I also ask? And there's quick. one important, very quick yeah. question: Is if you actually take the vaccination, it seems to me that anything you do at the moment, they still say wear a mask, socially distance, stay at home, and you're going to be locked down. I mean, you can have had it. The vaccination is meant to give you 
just as having had it would with, say, for example, Boris Johnson, a way that you don't pass it on. But actually, then we find out, well, even if you have had it and you're not likely to pass it on, and there's only about 10 people in the world that we think has had it a second time, you still got to socially isolate and not go out. So, you know, the, the problem is, is that I think it's also been used as a silver bullet. So I'm delighted to have it, but I think it's being overstated. And I also think that we've arrived at a situation where being told what to do for the good of our health and the, everybody else's mm. is dangerously okay. uh, nerve wracking if you're as believer in a free we society. We will take more questions. Okay, Last question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 let me reintroduce my panel to you. Florence Sashalomi is a Labour MP. Claire Fox is a, I was going to say Brexit Party peer, but you're not, are you? You're <laughs> no. a crossbench. Uh, no, uh, non-affiliated. Oh, so that's not crossbench? No, What's you have to apply to be crossbench. Oh. What? You have six months quarantine I think, so they can check out whether you're a complete <laughs> lunatic. Oh, well, bad luck. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> I, I probably will be non-affiliated for some time. <laughs> um, David Liddington, you're not yet in the House of Lords, but you ought to be. Um, thank you for joining us. And Hashi Mohammed, I'm sure your time is going to come too. Uh, let's don't go wish, to our next don't question. Don't wish such a thing on me. Do not wish exactly. such a thing on me. <laughs> I think it's, all, it's all right. It, it, you're not missing much, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> John is in Preston. John, what's your question, please? Oh, good evening, Ian. Yes, I, I paid tax for 44 years, uh, Ian, and I'm in the three million excluded group. So my question for the panel, please, is why the government choose to keep ignoring people like myself who've paid tax over these years? That's the question I'd like to ask, please. OK, Claire Fox. Well, I don't know what the three million group is, I've got to ask. Well, you see, that's a is terrible this... thing that you do No, I know, know, exactly. But you mean the people who are not getting the any people support? people who are self No, I'm just checking before I start yeah. talking. No point, <laughs> no point pretending when you don't know. Actually, I didn't know it's called the three million group, but I've actually been obsessed with the people who have not got uh, any help during this time because one of the things that you realize I mean apart from the fact that those people who are you know lockdown enthusiasts I mean the the absolute horrors of what this is causing in terms of the economy and people's livelihoods and so on has been terrible but all, the only thing I ever hear anyone say is oh well we've got furlough or carry on having furlough but there are huge numbers of people because of the way that work works in this country, zero hours workers, people who work self-employed, all sorts of people who just don't fit into anything. The big lobby groups around this ended up being, of all things, people who work in the arts. And I, I every sympathy with freelancers who work in the arts, but they kind of got a voice and they're quite popular and mm. fashionable. So then suddenly huge amounts of money is put to one side for the arts. And I don't actually think the solution to all of these things is just keep giving money because I actually want the economy to be opened up again. But that's one side. There are still all of these people like um, our caller who are just not getting anything. And I get messages all the time from people who are desperate and they put all of their energy and creativity over the years forming new small little organizations that just don't fit into the niche i don't know what to do about it i mean i kind of mention it tell people in politics you might say i'm in politics but you know the people who've got power you try and draw attention to rishi sunak seems to be giving out lots of support all over the place so i just can't understand why they can't see that there's this group of people who are desperate uh, and also, David Liddington, these people are, you could describe many of them as natural conservative voters. Do, does this show the limitation of government, that there can never be a scheme to cover everyone and that maybe the Treasury has just put it in the too difficult bo box, I, which I think a lot of people will be element, very frustrated yeah, by? I think there's a strong, strong element of truth to that, Ian. I mean, the, the sort of the three million we're talking about, it, it includes different categories of people. So it includes freelancers, including musicians and uh, actors and, and, and the like. It includes people who have only recently become self-employed, so they don't have the track record yeah. of accounts uh, against For which sure. support could be measured. And it's direct company directors, you know, which often means the di directors, a husband and wife perhaps, of a very small family business who take their income through dividends rather than through salaries. And I suspect the truth of this is that the Treasury is thinking, A, it's just too complicated because these people don't fit neatly into a category that shows up on the, the Treasury's databases in the way that those who have been paying 
um, self-employed national insurance uh, contributions for uh, a year or more do, or that people being paid by PAYE do. Um, and also they worry, I think, that particularly when it comes to the company directors, or if we give it to the the, 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 the little one man, one woman band uh, at that level, well, you can't write a rule that doesn't then allow the directors of big PLCs and the like to to claim as well. Partnerships are another, another category that, that, that sometimes uh, falls into this trap. My view is that, frankly, the government ought to uh, be trying to do more and not just say, well, you can apply for universal credit if you run mm. out of resources. And I, I think that at the very least, I'd like to see the government explain in greater detail why they have concluded at the moment that this is too difficult. Because I think it's the, the, the one thing that frustrates me about the government's handling of, of, of COVID. And I, I try not to criticise them too much because they are facing the most horrendous set of decisions between choices, none of which are nice. Um, and sometimes six months down the line, you can say, oh, yes, that was a mistake. But actually, six months ago, it was reason a reasonable decision, giving, given the evidence and the advice available at that time. But I just wish they'd be more open with people. I think there's still a huge store of public goodwill over handling the pandemic. People get this is really tough. Um, but I think governments could trust people or be open okay. with their arguments and how they try to balance different, different mm. interests. Hashi. Yes, I think um, some of you may or may not know that um, barristers are, for the most part, self-employed. And with the courts often closed and many uh, hearings not taking place and many of the individuals not being able to represent their clients properly, we fall into that category of, of mm. people whose businesses, because we are effectively sole traders and small businesses individually, are affected and contrary to public and yeah. popular um, popular tales, we're not all fat cat lawyers. So it is a real issue. Are you sure? Uh, well, I'm certainly not fat and I'm not a cat. So, <laughs> You're uh, definitely not fat. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but you know, it's, it's, it's really hard. And I, and I want to sympathise with what David was saying in relation to this being an incredibly imperfect time to find solutions. And we have to try and plug as many holes as possible. But I would say that they need to think a bit harder because most self-employed companies or, or small businesses or self-employed individuals will be paying taxes like everyone else, will be probably also VAT registered. There must be a way in which they can be assisted. I know, for example, for us, we have been given more, more time to pay our tax. We've been given more time to pay our VAT. There are small loans, the, the um, bounce back loans, which... Incidentally, actually, that's something that's really important. Incidentally, the bounce back loan now, Ian and, 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 and others in the studio who may not know, banks are actually not giving them as willingly as you might think anymore. Mm. And some banks have actually stopped taking applications. So those are the kind of things that some people who might not have wanted to take those loans earlier, but are now having to think, actually, I do need the loan now, are finding mm. themselves in a position where banks are no longer taking applications. That's and just as seriously, a lot of banks are refusing to open new business accounts yes. uh, for many it, months, exactly. which I just think is incredible when we're trying to get the economy back on its feet. Uh, Florence. And I think just on that last point, just the amount of fraudulent applications that have then come through, which is going to cost all of us UK PLC taxpayers. I think for, for John and, you know, the many constituents <coughs> that I represent in Vauxhall, we have, you know, I've got the whole of the South Bank, a number of key institutions where a number of people are self-employed, a number of people run their own businesses. For them, they haven't had any support since March. Let's remember that. For a number of them, they're having to beg, borrow and steal just to keep a roof over their head. And I think the fact that they have paid their taxes, they've paid their national insurance, they can evidence that there has to be a way for Treasury officials to come up with something. They need to sit down with excluded UK um, 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 organisers and look at a way of resolving this issue, especially if we are still going to see additional lockdowns coming forward. And it's a case of... If we can see the government spending, and in some cases misspending billions on contracts, how do you think John and those others that haven't received any support feel? If we can see multinational businesses like British Airways, British Gas, all accessing furlough, companies that were making profit, but yet that one man that, you know, is 
struggling to make ends meet, always does the right thing. They don't get any support. How do you think they feel? The government needs to revisit this and look at it hard. Uh, John, thank you very much for your question. Hope you got some answers there, even if they weren't maybe uh, the ones that you were maybe hoping for. Uh, we'll take some more comments and questions from you in just a moment on Conversation. Cross Question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. Let's go to our next caller. It's Charles in Hull. Charles, what's your question, please? Oh, hello, uh, Ian and the panel. Um, uh, having lived through the uh, 80s with the militant tendency against Nick, uh, Neil Kinnock, um, uh, is the NEC, um, uh, with its belief in reinstating um, Jeremy Corbyn into the Labour Party against Keir Starmer's will, um, who's going to win? Florence Oshilomi, I know you were gagging to answer this question. This... I think what we need to look at is the fact that the decision to reinstate Jeremy back was taken by the NEC, not Keir. Um, the decision on party whip or whether or not Jeremy sits as an MP was taken by Keir. So those are two separate things. But to the general public, they look, think it's a bit odd, don't they? What I think the general public want to see from the Labour Party is the fact that we've been through a process where the Equalities and Human Rights Commission has looked at our party and found that we are institutionally racist on anti-Semitism. That should shame us as a party. That shames me as a Labour Party member. And there are a clear set of recommendations that the Labour Party now have to follow and adopt. And one of the things that Keir said when he took up the role as leader was that there has to be zero, zero tolerance on this. So I think instead of us looking at the issue of one person, we need to look at how we as the Labour Party rebuild our trust with the Jewish community. We need to look at those clear recommendations. And I wouldn't want us to distract from that because of what's happened with Jeremy. Um, I ran in 2019. Jeremy was then leader. I campaigned on that manifesto led by Jeremy. Jeremy is no longer leader. He's my colleague now in Parliament. Well, he isn't now, I, is he? Well, uh, he will sit as an independent. But what here has been clear on saying is that it is under review. So I don't think that his expulsion is going to be permanent. I think it's under review. And it's something that the leadership and the NEC will then look at. But do at. you agree with the NEC or do you agree with Keir? This isn't about whether or not I agree with the NEC or agree well, with that's Keir. The question I'm asking. What, what I agree with is the fact that we, as the Labour Party, um, the issues around anti-Semitism and the fact that it took the Equalities and Human Rights Commission to call that out, and we should never, ever in 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 our party's history find ourselves in that position. That's what I'm clear about, and that's what yeah, I want okay, the leadership okay, to look at. It both ways, or trying to have it both ways. You, you either agree that Jeremy Corbyn should be reinstated, or you don't. That's not a decision for me it's to make. It's not a decision, but you will have an opinion on it. I, I have an opinion in that Jeremy's, well, Jeremy's reflected on his comments that he made three weeks ago, and he's um, he's seen that his comments maybe were not the right comments, and the NEC's taken that decision. The decision in terms of the whip lies with Keir as the party leader, and that will be for Keir to decide whether or not he joins but back. But to, Jew to Jewish members of the Labour Party, or at least I would say most of them, they're, they're going to see this as a complete fudge, and I think the electorate are going to see it as a fudge. We did a phone-in on it, was it last night or the night before? I, I, I was inundated with texts from people particularly saying, well, I was actually willing to give Keir Starmer another go, but this has really shaken me. I, to that, um, to any Jewish members listening, I, I would say um, continue to, to, to look at what the Labour Party is doing. And I think, again, he has been very clear in terms of his stance on zero tolerance, and that means zero tolerance. See, whenever a politician says something's very clear, it usually means the exact opposite, <laughs> doesn't it? Um, Hashi Mohammed, what's your view on this? Was, I mean, was, I think was, it's... A... Was it right to reinstate Jeremy Corbyn? I don't know the details of, of what happened with the investigation, but I think on balance it was probably too soon to reinstate him. I think that a further investigation that looked at this issue in a bit more detail would have been useful. I think a bit more reflection on the part of Jeremy and the way in which he has approached this issue would have been welcome. The Jewish community is terribly, terribly sad about what, ha what has been happening with the Labour Party and Jeremy himself has accepted that there is a level of anti-Semitism that has been allowed to exist and run riot within the, lab within the Labour Party for a, a, a far too long. I think, but now for me, the biggest worry is that you have a leader, 
a current leader of the Labour Party who is having to deal with the former leader and the former leader's problems, mess and issues in such a way and at a time when the current Prime Minister and the leader of the Conservative Party, quite frankly, is there for the taking. And so for me, what the Labour Party is doing and the, to the question of what Charles was asking is simply again what they were doing in the 1980s of this navel, navel gazing of just simply not understanding that a democracy is worth nothing when it doesn't have effective and proper opposition that can hold the government to account. David. Uh, I actually agree with Hashi's last point. Um, I think that it's in the interests of any democratic country for the government of the day to be up against an opposition that is seen by voters as a potential alternative government. That keeps the government on its toes. It government means government tends to make better decisions and people have a choice. And I I, I like Kistan. I, I, a lot of respect for him, you know, got to know him reasonably well when we were in the Commons together. Um, and I'm, the problem with uh, this decision is that it shows that Keir isn't fully in charge of the Labour Party and that the Labour Party hasn't fully come to terms with the Equalities and Human Rights Commission's damning report. And worse than any of that, worse than any of the politics of this, is the message that it sends to the British Jewish community, for many of whom memories of the Holocaust are just a generation back. I mean, you might get my sort of age, the I was at school where the num quite a number of the boys I was at school with were Jewish and they had parents who had got out of Germany or Central Europe just in time in the 1930s. I had two boys in my class who ha had fathers who had survived Auschwitz. I always remember going to, to tea with one of my mates and his parents and his, his dad, I can't remember the circumstances, his dad suddenly rolled up his sleeve and showed me the Auschwitz camp number that had been tattooed into his wrist. And, and I had friends of mine who have lived and made successful lives themselves, brought up families and grandchildren, certainly children in the UK, who said to me, if Jeremy Corbyn wins the 2019 general election, I'm afraid I am, I'm making arrangements to emigrate. And it was not a joke. It wasn't, wasn't a party political point. It was, there was, was real fear. And my worry about this decision by the Labour Party's executive committee is that it will cause those fears to rise again. And I, I really do hope, gen as a lifelong Tory who will never support the Labour Party in an election, I really hope that Keir and those who think like him do manage to, to get a grip on this and get on top of this because it's the interest of the country that anti-Semitism is utterly rejected. Okay. Claire Fox. The internal procedure... Oh, don't do that. The internal procedural obsession about how the Labour Party have dealt with this, I fear, takes our eye off the real issue, which is anti-Semitism and what it is and how to fight it and, and, and deal with it. So, I did not agree with the expulsion of um, Jeremy Corbyn necessarily. I mean, I'm not in the Labour Party. I wouldn't necessarily have expelled him because it felt to me as though we ended up in a situation where what was being saved was the reputation of the Labour Party rather than tackling the issues of anti-Semitism. And, and now there's the NEC and the inter... I mean, it's like sort of... The big issue surely is that rampant on the left, which I consider myself to be part of regardless, I've noticed and have been actually arguing that there has been a tendency to conflate Israel with Jewish people, criticism of Israel, an obsessive criticism of Israel, the conspiratorial, you know, big bankers, a particularly crass form of anti-capitalism that's dominated the left, which has been unhelpful for anyone on the left, but which has played into so many of the stereotypes around Jewish people in a very unhelpful way. So my, I suppose why I get nervous is, I don't, I don't, you know, Keir Hart, uh, you know, Keir Hardy, I do that all the time. <laughs> Keir Starmer and Florence and lots of people campaigned for 
uh, you know, for Jeremy Corbyn. When I raised anti-Semitism as a problem in the election, I was basically, you know, told that I was just playing politics. Mm. Well, I don't. So I, I don't see any evidence that anyone is taking anti-Semitism seriously. Other than they keep saying they're taking it seriously and kicking people out. I actually want more debate, not the silencing of debate in case you get called anti-Semitic. Because I really would like to root out anti-Semitism. Uh, Charles, thank you very much for that question. We have a very meaty question coming up. Don't go anywhere. It's a first question with Ian Dale on LBC. Let's go to our next questioner. It's Ulf in Hamburg. Ulf, guten Abend. What would you like to ask? Good Abend. Well, it's a, a binary question. A, everyone is wondering whether we are going to get a, a trade agreement. What do you think or what do the panel members think the chances are on B? Why should the Europeans care? We can take the hit and think there is a considerable uh, political benefit to a no deal Brexit for the EU. Okay, uh, David Liddington, former Europe minister. <laughs> I think I think it's in the balance. I think I, I still am in the camp that thinks it's uh, 55 45 that there will be a deal, a, a sort of thinner deal and a more distant relationship that personally I would have prefer, would have preferred. But it, it'll be the kind of deal that the prime minister campaigned for when he sought the conservative leadership and again at the general election. So he can claim a mandate for that approach. I, I, to to, to Ulf's question, I think there are two key reasons why the 27 other governments um, have an interest in the deal and why they have remained committed to the negotiation. I mean, the first is economic, that uh, at uh, particularly during the pandemic and at a time of huge technological and economic change globally, the last thing that it's in anybody's interest to do is interrupt established, successful, just-in-time supply chains that stretch across continents, whether in the food and drink industry or the automotive industry or the aviation industry or others. But secondly, if you look around the world, what we thought about as the West since about the late 1940s is coming under huge strain. The uh, United States um, has questioned its long-standing role as the guarantor of European security and a rules-based international order. And though Biden will be different from Trump, he will still expect the European allies, uh, Europe, however you define it, to do more, exercise more political leadership and to spend more on its own security. Putin and Xi, in their different ways, are claiming their political models are superior to more effective than the democratic pluralist model that the European democracies have championed. Huge pressures from technological change, huge pressures from large scale migration from the continent of Africa that are going to continue. Um, international crime and terrorism threatening every European democracy and not respecting national frontiers. Actually, there are good geopolitical reasons why the democracies of Europe should hang together. It'll be a different UK-EU relationship from when we were members of the EU, but I very much hope that there will be a willingness on both sides to build this different but constructive style of partnership to meet the challenges that we all face in common. OK, um, Florence. I think it's in everyone's interest that we get a deal. Um, so the transition period ends on the 31st of December, 43 days and counting. We are on our, I think we're on the fourth, third prime minister in three years since the referendum, in, four years since the referendum in 2016. The prime minister campaigned on this in 2019 general election that, you know, we are going to have a deal, let's get Brexit done. So I think this back and fro with the EU is in nobody's interest. We need those discussions to continue to happen. We need clarity on what that deal is and we need that deal to come back to parliament and i think um there is still quite a lot of uncertainty around what that deal is going to contain do you think there will be one though I, I i'm hoping that there will be one um i campaign vigorously for us to remember the argument's been done been there done that mm. got the t-shirt and the stickers thank you very much highest remaining constituency in London, thank you very much. But, we, you know, what's the next phase? And, and to agree with David, it's a case of we now, in, in, the, in the world global sphere, we can't think of ourselves as little Britain. We have to think about our relationship. It will be a different one with the EU. And it's really important, should, I think. Why should they care? Why they should, should care. care. I think they should care because essentially there are still a number of us 
you know, deep within our hearts who still feel European. Again, you know, I, I'll, I'll keep referring to my constituency. I've got a large Portuguese community, a number of French people. So it is in our interest and they should care. And I think um, it's imperative, especially now, at this global financial crisis of COVID, not just the health implication, it's really important that we have a good trade deal with our closest, you know, whether mm. or not you want to look at the, the distance, they are our closest allies. And, you know, it's okay. really, really important. Hashi. I really hope there is a deal. And I hope that we will make sure that we don't crash out without a deal. I think the departure of Dominic Cummings um, is an indication that that might well be where we're headed. I think it's in our interest to get a deal. And I think to a lesser extent, but just as important, it's in the interest of the European Union to get a deal. I really don't think that we are leaving Europe in, in a way that says that we don't have our interests aligned. We may have left the European Union and the, the political union that, that has been and gone for our purposes, we have voted out, we have to find a way forward. I was very much one of those people who voted to remain, who lived in France, like you, uh, having spent some time in Germany, Ian, and, and, and really I'm very, very fond of the European continent. But I think that we now have to forge and make sense of this future and I'm just sad that it's going to be a future without a bigger union that we could be at the heart of. And crucially, and finally, as David was saying, we have a we had a really important position to play that role between the United States and the European Union and actually leverage it in a way that we could play one against the other. That has been diminished significantly, um, but hopefully in the future we can find another way in which we can potentially and strongly ensure that we leverage our small power in the best way that we can. OK, uh, Claire Fox, former Brexit Party MEP, concentrate on the second part of the question. Why should Europe care about doing a deal with us? Well, I, they don't need to, I, but but Europe and the EU are distinct, and it is important this, which is, is that um, despite what's been said, you know, I'm a proud European. I. I'm an enthusiast about the European continent and I've never believed in Little Britain. We're talking about a trade deal and the difficulties in relation to this trade deal and the withdrawal agreement are, are you know, lots has been written about it. I think it's not the end of the world if there's no trade deal for the EU, for the UK. I don't think Barnier and the EU are behaving as though they are going to get a trade deal, but I, my, my suspicion is that there will be one. I just don't want one at any cost and I fear that as Brexit was never about trade, but it was about sovereignty, that to get a deal, Boris is going to betray sovereignty. And that's what a lot of leavers are thinking about. But just on the, the points that David made, very important. The West is under stress and under strain, and there are challenges, and we've all seen that in international, you know, democracy, and uh, as he explained. But, you know, the way I think you have to deal with this is, for example, when President Macron in France came out and made that fantastically important speech about enlightenment values and the West and standing together, I think we should have said, we support you, and every country, yeah. and Merkel should have said that, mm -hmm. But Merkel didn't say that. And in fact, Boris Johnson didn't say that. In fact, he was very isolated and up against it, defending Western values. That's got nothing to do with being in the EU. So I do think that if you're going to defend and fight for democracy, you actually have to fight for the sovereignty of different countries and respect their sovereignty. But you've also got to fight for uh, the European values the EU say it embodies. And I think we could do that whether we're in the EU or not. We're out of the EU, but let's see the fight for the values. Uh, let's go back to Ulf. We're running out of time, Ulf, so very briefly, your reaction to what you've heard. Oh, from a merely intellectual point of view, I'm inclined to agree. Let me put it this way. Maybe you're unaware of the amount of annoyance felt for the United Kingdom at the moment. No one cares that you're leaving. So, <laughs> we all understand that. Uh, <laughs> therefore, don't expect there to be an upheaval if there is no deal. Fine. Well, on that, Good, I'm cool. On that, on that positive note, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll end that there. Just um, a quick final question from Stephanie in Cambridge on a text. Oxford students have voted to ban beef and lamb from campus canteens. What food would you ban? Florence. Oh, because it's coming close to Christmas. Oh, Brussels sprouts. I'm so sorry. I agree with you. Uh, Claire? Sorry, I would ban... Oxford students banning things. They ban far too much. <laughs> That's and a cop out. Come on, you must have some food that you really hate. 
quinoa. I don't even know how to pronounce it. No, if I need it. I don't know what that is. David, David, David Livington. Quinoa. Is that how you say it? Oh, yeah. 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 Hard boiled eggs. Oh, no, they are. I love, love them. them. Yes, oh, no, no. I just, Hashi. Hashi. I really I bad. I ban them. everyone who makes really bad ice cream. <laughs> is there such a thing as bad ice cream? It's a, it's a very selective I, I'll thing. throw avocado into the mix. Well, that's, well, like, oh, yeah. that's oh, it for oh, today. Yeah. You can catch up on this podcast on the Global Player or wherever you get your podcasts from. And, of course, you can catch up on YouTube as well. Uh, do join us again next week for Cross Question at 8. You're listening to LBC. It's two minutes past nine. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, Public Health England has warned allowing household mixing over Christmas will have to be counterbalanced. It says each day of lighter coronavirus restrictions.